evening, everybody, both here in this wonderful room and following us on the live stream to tonight's event uh, for Jesus College and the Intellectual Forum and for the Cambridge Festival of Ideas. I'm Julian Huppert. I'm director of the Intellectual Forum here, and our role is to get people to think and talk about interesting things. Uh, tonight's talk, of course, being a wonderful example. But over the last couple of years, we've had some amazing events with world leaders, fashion leaders, um, amazingly inspiring people. And there's a huge program still to come. So I hope you'll have a look at what we're doing. We have more events uh, coming up next week, uh, and there's many more throughout the year. Jesus College, for those of you who don't know it, is very old. We were originally a 12th century nunnery. Uh, we then changed in 1496 to become an all-male college. We corrected that swing 40 years ago to be properly co-educational. We've had an amazing range of people who've gone from here to change the world. Uh, everyone from Thomas Cranmer, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Malthus, Lisa Jardine, a huge range of people. And of course, our students and our fellows will be the people people like me will list in another 50 to 100 years as the people who went on to change the world. So no pressure to those of you who are in the audience. Here we have some slightly more modern facilities which make it much easier for us to showcase the wonderful work that's being done by people from the college. And tonight we have somebody I'm really delighted to welcome here, uh, none other than the president of our college. We have both a new master um, and an extremely experienced and very talented president. Uh, James is a, is a linguist and an expert in languages. He's normally very well behaved, but tonight he's going to talk to us about swearing. James, it's wonderful to have you here, um, and I hope you won't shock the audience too much. Thank you very much, Julian, and it's a real pleasure to be here and see all these eager people who are so interested in linguistics. I'm sure that's really why you've come, because you're interested, like me, in the history of language, in the history of words. And maybe if there's a little bit of swearing in, in between, you wouldn't mind that as well. Um, I should say that I am going to be talking in this talk um, about taboo vocabulary. So I am going to be using um, some swear words. Uh, and that's why you're all here, isn't it? To hear me say fuck, basically. <laughs> so uh, that's, you know, that will come uh, during the talk. But what I'm not going to use is I'm going to not going to use any abusive terms. So I'm not going to use any terms which uh, pick out or single out um, people by their physical characteristics or their gender or sexuality or anything like that. And in any questions afterwards, I'd also <coughs> be very grateful of, I think, members of the audience if we you know, steer clear of abusive terms. Uh, I will f use language which people, some people find offensive, and those are relating often to sexual acts and bodily functions and parts of the body, uh, and some other things which you'd be surprised that some people find, you know, oh, you shouldn't say that. Uh, but no abuse, please. Well, you can abuse me. Okay, firstly, um, uh, I'm going to have, ask you a question. Um, what's happening in this picture? Uh, Julian talked about fashion leaders, influential people. Uh, here we have one, um, apparently. People will know who this is. Uh, what is the dog doing? P piddling, pissing, any other? Peeing. What, el what else might we say is the dog doing? Do people use? Urinating. Urinating. Uh, Having a slash, that's very good. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? We have so many different words for pissing, basically. You know, it's not an action which is hugely varied, but we have a very big, large vocabulary um, for pissing. And we tend to use, I'll just give you some examples of the, you know, some of the ones we had, um, P. Uh, which is actually the word um, <coughs> the NHS now use instead of urinate, they use the word pee in all their official um, documents. If you go to NHS online, they talk about pee and poo, which seems to me very, you know, very odd when, when um, you know, a doctor says to you, uh, sometimes they say pee, sometimes they say wee wee, and that just seems, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I'm a grown man, you know, you don't need to ask me about wee wee. Uh, but, uh, P is now, uh, has now become, rather than being a, a word which children would use, uh, it certainly was when I was growing up, well, certainly we, uh, but become a, um, quite a common word. 
uh, piss and pee. Uh, piss, we might not use piss in all circumstances, all of us. I mean, I think you, know, you probably wouldn't expect a professor at Cambridge University when addressing a room full of people to say, I've just had a piss, or I'm just going for a piss. You know, that is uh, actually, it doesn't seem the right environment for saying that. Uh, it doesn't seem, it seems uh, too crude, I think people would say. So normally, you know, the, the kind of polite term we have is urinate. Um, yeah, we, 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 piddle, whittle, cock the dog's leg, uh, point person. You know, we have all sorts of different, um, we have all sorts of different ways of saying, of saying the same thing. I don't think probably the dog is not probably pointing Percy at the porcelain, but... Um, uh, so that's um, something which is general about a lot of the language I'm going to talk about. Uh, there are a lot of different variant terms. Uh, and often you can divide the variant terms into something which we would call a taboo term um, and a euphemism term. So a taboo term is um, the basic term uh, often considered offensive or rude, and the euphemism uh, might be the more polite way of saying something. Uh, and which one you use often depends on context. Uh, so the taboo term, uh, now not so taboo as it once was, but certainly uh, piss uh, would have been a taboo term uh, 50 years ago. And in still some, you know, if someone said it in the wrong context, I think people would be um, upset about it. But that's replaced you know, in kind of everyday speech by pee and urinate. Uh, incidentally, where does the word pee come from? Does anyone know? It's the first letter of piss. It's like people say the F word instead of fuck. They used to say P, just, you know, I'm just not going to say the whole word. I'm just going to say the very first letter of piss. And so that was one way of kind of yeah, saying the same thing, but not actually uttering the taboo word. Uh, we, there's a whole um, uh, range of these. So um, shit, if, if you like, the taboo word. And the euphemistic terms are things like poo, as I said in the NHS, they use poo, uh, defecate, uh, medical term, defecate, uh, go to the bathroom. Uh, I used to work in a, in a stables in the United States, and I remember once um, the other person working at the stables with me uh, said, that horse has just gone to the bathroom in its bucket. <laughs> I really couldn't kind of um, put, comprehend what she was talking about. Because, uh, 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 yeah. So yeah, it's very strange how you get these euphemisms <laughs> rather than saying the, the taboo form. Uh, fart, uh, lots of nice um, past wind, flatulence. Uh, a raspberry, raspberry you know, originally Cockney rhyming slam, raspberry tart, fart, um, arse, uh, and, you know, lots and lots of polite ways of saying arse or medical ways or Latin ways. And um, uh, finally, we have uh, fuck, with copulate, have sex, you know, lots and lots of different ways of saying these things. Now, if you look, what I really do is um, um, look at the history of languages and the history of words. If you look at where these words come from, it's quite interesting because a lot of these words on this side are actually very, very old words. Um, so a word like um, fart, for example, you can trace that word back several thousand years. Uh, that word goes back to uh, an Indo-European root. Indo-European, I'll say a bit more about that later, was the original language family from which most languages of Europe and northern India descend. Uh, and we can trace that back uh, 5,000 years and more. And that word fart, um, was an Indo-European word. So people have been using that word for 5,000 years. Uh, but then when they think, well, that's actually a bit impolite, uh, when they start getting ideas of, of um, polite language and correct language, people have ways of, of um, uh, making that nicer, euphemistically, saying the same thing without actually uttering the fart word. Uh, arse, similarly, arse is a very old word. Uh, in terms of language history. And the words on this side, often, I mean, they come from various different origins, but often you have these words which actually derive from Latin. So um, Latin was the language of culture. 
uh, after the Roman Empire, people still carried on using Latin in the Middle Ages, and later Latin was the language of the church, of the Roman Catholic Church. Then Latin was the learned language. It was a language people um, would learn at school, at university. Uh, here in Jesus College, uh, we still have to swear an oath in Latin before we become a fellow. Uh, so Latin was seen as the educated higher register. And English took a lot of their educated words from Latin. And interestingly also, in, in the medical register, Latin w was the language used. And so in this kind of medical um, way of saying something, you often have these Latinate terms like urinate is from Latin, defecate, flatulence, anus, copulate. All these are Latin terms which have been borrowed into English to make sort of polite alternatives, euphemistic alternatives to the taboo terms. Now, um, if you look at um, the history of swearing of these kind of rude vocabulary in English, it's actually quite interesting. And what I'm going to do for the first part of this talk is just look a bit at what common attitudes towards some of this vocabulary and how that has changed over time and some of the um, ways in which we use um, this obscene vocabulary, often thought of obscene vocabulary, um, and the way that that has, um, has changed over time. So um, you can download from the web this wonderful um, uh, guide from Ofcom where they looked at a whole host of all the rude words they could think of uh, and decided how offensive or asked a panel of people to find out how offensive people found these words. And then they actually, um, these are what they use to decide what goes on after the watershed on TV or radio, after 9 o'clock. Uh, so the BBC will try and avoid some language before 9 o'clock, and other language after 9 o'clock is permitted. Uh, so they have uh, various levels of offensiveness. So mild, is, uh, really they don't mind um, mild language being on. Uh, so arse, fart, crap, bloody, bugger, damn, and bonk are all classed as you know, mild uh, swear words, which are mildly offensive. You know, some people might clutch their pearls you know, when they hear these, uh, um, <laughs> but um, most of us, we, you know, m most people in a, in a survey found these quite acceptable. To me, that's quite interesting. When I was growing up, bloody uh, was a very, very um, shocking word. You know, if, if a member of the royal family, for example, was heard to say bloody, uh, Princess Anne, I believe, uh, if I remember rightly, was once heard recorded saying bloody, and there was a national uproar. You know, the newspapers, headlines and things, you know, this is not suitable language. And certainly bugger, you know, bugger would be uh, a word, you know, completely um, taboo when I was growing up. Now it's just quite, uh, quite mild. Ofcom, her next category is um, moderate, um, interesting here you have words which are, you know, quite similar to the mild terms. So arse is mild, but arse whole, oh, no, 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 that's just, uh, that's just way worse. Um, and pissed off for angry shit. Um, feck is an interesting one. Feck really, um, I mean, it became popularised with the comedy show Father Ted. Um, when people seem to um, just accept the fact that they, they had these um, Irish uh, people just saying feck all the time. And somehow it, no one really said, no, no, we must take this off the air. They said, well, it's not fuck, it's feck. Somehow that's okay. Um, and um, strong, uh, so in terms of body parts, dick and twat, uh, called strong language. So this is normally not um, permissible before 9 p.m. And then the strongest, um, and here we have what's called in the business technically a flying fuck. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. I spent ages getting this PowerPoint just for that joke. It was really. <laughs> um, now, with any of this um, language, this um, kind of taboo language, some people um, will be quite familiar with it. But since it's not generally said in polite company, sometimes people don't actually know these words and know what they, um, what they mean or they don't hear them. Certainly, if you look at that Ofcom uh, brochure, there's a lot of words which I'd never heard of. 
yeah, which were said, you know, considered by some people extremely offensive, but you know, if you've never heard of them, you have no idea what people are talking about. Uh, and this is one thing which is quite interesting if you look at all these um, kind of rude words, this taboo vocabulary, uh, that some of it is um, kind of so rude that no one says it, and then people don't know what it means. Uh, now, there's a very nice example of this uh, from the Victorian poet Robert Browning. Uh, so here's Robert Browning, so, you know, quite a difficult Victorian poet to understand. Um, he wrote this long poem, um, Pippa Passes, which is very good, I recommend it, very nice poem. Uh, one passage of it um, has this, uh, this nice line, so, um, but at night, Brother Howlett, far over the woods, toll the word to thy chantry, sing to the bat's sleek sisterhoods, full compliance with gallantry. Then owls and bats, cows and twats, monks and nuns, in the cloister's mood, adjourn to the oak stump pine tree. And um, you think, what is this word twats doing here in the middle of it? Um, uh, what is Browning trying to do? And in, when they were writing the, um, first writing the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, they first started that in the middle of the 19th century, Browning was still alive, and the editors of the Oxford English Dictionary were a bit confused. What, it, what is he thinking of when he's writing about cowls and traps? Cowl is a, a monk's hood, you know, so it's talking about all these people kind of gathering. Uh, what is, um, what's happening here with the cows and twa uh, twats? You know, where do the twats come in? Um, and so uh, the editor of the Oxford English Dictionary wrote to Robert Browning and said, what's going on here? Um, and Browning wrote back. Um, so he said he'd been reading uh, some, you know, he read widely in some 17th century literature. Uh, and there's this nice poem where they talked of his having a cardinal's hat. They'd send him as soon an old nun's twat. Um, and so Browning, you know, reading this, had no idea of what was going on. And he actually wrote... <laughs> the word... <laughs> So there you have it. You know, some people, and you know, this will become important later on, some people are um, so kind of isolated from the world of taboo language that they go through their whole life with no understanding of what's going on. Now, if you look um, across different cultures and you look at the way people you know, swear in different cultures, it's actually quite interesting. You find that the way um, we swear or some of us swear, I don't have a swear, um, in the, uh, some of us swear in, the, in English, is actually not replicated in other languages. Uh, so, you know, we think, well, if we say to people, fuck off in a different language, it will mean the same thing. But sometimes if you try that in a different language, people just look at you, what do you mean? You know, it, it's, uh, the same things are not felt to be offensive in all different cultures. Uh, Normally the word for fuck is obscene, so normally that's avoided, but you can't actually use that as a, a term of abuse like that or as a swear word. You, if you drop something on your toe, you wouldn't say, uh, have sex or copulate. <laughs> uh, it just seems rather a, a strange thing to do. So um, in different cultures you get some different um, uh, things get kind of taken out as being swear words. Uh, anyone who speaks Dutch, any native Dutch speakers here, That's lucky, because I, I, my Dutch is terrible. My wife is a Dutch speaker, but I, um, I um, don't speak Dutch. But in Dutch, you have this um, set of abusive vocabulary, which is actually uh, really quite shocking uh, when you look at it in a kind of English um, context. Um, they will call something like a kankerfrau, uh, a cancer woman, or they'll just say, go and get cancer or even go and get typhoid fever, or clara, or you know, all these um, smallpox, yeah, which I don't think, any, you know, the prevalence of smallpox in the Netherlands is not high. Uh, uh, so, you know, a different set of things um, are used as this word, of, uh, these swear words, uh, if you like, in, in Dutch. Uh, French Canadian are even better. Uh, they have massively... Um, uh, fantastic uh, swear words. So one of their big swear words is tabernacle, uh, which, you know, I've been with people who, uh, any French Canadians here, I should say, before? Uh, 
No one, no one's walking out. I didn't hear doors slamming, as French Canadians have heard me. That's one of the worst swear words you can say, apparently, in, in um, Quebec. And I have actually um, known a, a Quebecois woman who would say, ah, tabernac, and you know, say, what? They actually say, tabernacle. These are things based on religious vocabulary, um, which are considered profane, and so for swearing, they take that religious vocabulary. So they have other words like osti, the host. So in the um, Christian religious service, the Eucharist, uh, the bread in the um, Christian service is called the host, the osti in French. And they use that as a swear word. You know, if you, if you drop something on your toe, you'll say that. Uh, calice or cibois. You know, this really quite arcane vocabulary. But to them, it's quite shocking. Uh, so in different cultures, different cultures decide which of the kind of vocabulary which is in some way special vocabulary they will use as, as swear words vocabulary. And even if you look in English, um, you can actually see that there's been a change historically, quite a recent change, um, from a more religious vocabulary of swearing uh, to a more scatological sexual vocabulary of swearing. Um, so this explains why so many of our kind of swearing expressions in English don't make sense, because they did make sense when they were talking about religious terms. Uh, so one of them, <coughs> if you've seen Gone with the Wind, you remember the last line of Gone with the Wind, uh, Rhett Butler says, I don't give a damn, uh, which at that time was really quite shocking. Damn was at that time a shocking word. Damn is for damnation. Um, which would be you know, said in, in times of stress. You'd say, damnation, I don't give a damn. We've now replaced that with, I don't give a shit. Yeah. So the nowadays, gone with the wind, you'd have the Rhett Butler saying at the end, I don't give a shit, or I don't give a fuck. Doesn't quite have the same effect, does it? Uh, or you know, religious, people might um, use the um, name of religious figures, like they might say, Holy Mary in the past would be considered... Uh, a profanity, it would be something you would say if you're in pain or stress. Now that's replaced by holy shit. So, you know, in the past we venerated religion, now we venerate shit. <laughs> um, in the same way, damn you, uh, curse you, uh, now fuck you. And, you know, as often has been remarked, you know, for, some, for a way of cursing someone, actually saying fuck you is not a very good way of cursing someone because you know it's not it's meant to be something bad and yeah not everyone thinks like that about fucking um, or uh, for God's sake uh, for fuck's sake yeah that clearly the fuck means nothing there it's, you're just replacing the word for God with a uh, um, a word which is a taboo word or what the hell now people say what the fuck so you know the reason why our swear words have this structure is because they used to be it used to make sense when we were all religious. Uh, now we're not religious and nothing makes sense. <laughs> so there are quite a few different things kind of relating here. Uh, different areas um, we're talking about which are kind of merging together. Um, obscenity is often... Uh, something which we avoid talking about because it's relating to parts of the body which we like to keep covered up or fluids or matters which come out of the body which we don't um, uh, like people to know about or bodily functions um, so that's often kind of classed as obscenity in some cultures uh, terms relating to disease and death are also taboo and avoided and you know you also get that in English a lot, a lot of people um, you know, will not use the word die about particularly a close um, loved person, they will say they passed away or they passed on. And somehow actually saying they died seems a bit, you know, a bit too brutal. Yeah. So you want to ameliorate that language in some way. Or <clears throat> with diseases, um, you know, certainly I don't know whether people still say it, but when I was growing up people used to say the C word quite a lot, you know, meaning not the C word we're thinking of, but cancer. You know, they've got, someone has got the big C. So they actually wouldn't use the term cancer because it's a bit frightening to use the term cancer. So that's one 
word which we wouldn't call really obscene, but it's taboo. It's something you don't like talking about. It's something you want to kind of, you want, wish wasn't there, so you don't really like thinking about it. Uh, in many cultures, um, terms relating to religion, we all have a special word for this profanity. Uh, that's normally those things which are actually not um, <coughs> speakable because they're talking about very important or special things uh, to people be who believe in them. Uh, and yeah, more generally, you have just other scary things. So anything which is a bit scary, yeah, in different cultures and at different times, people don't like using any vocabulary which is just a bit scary. Um, so what might be scary and what sort of thing might that um, uh, talk about? Well, um, this is something, you know, you might know Harry Potter. Who is this? Or, but are you allowed to say the name Voldemort? What do people... Mm, yes, people say, I mean, um, you know who or something like that, don't they, in Harry Potter. So, you know, they have this kind of, in the world of Harry Potter, he's quite a scary thing. So you don't want to utter him by name. Uh, you actually say some other, other words like, you know, uh, you know who or he shall not be named, do they call Voldemort? Yeah, yeah, he should not be named. So, you know, that's something scary. Uh, in, as I said, with uh, religious terms, often religious terms are um, avoided. And sometimes even the name of, of um, God himself, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of believers nowadays don't like taking the Lord's name in vain. They don't like uh, saying the word God unless they're actually praying to God. Uh, you had this uh, very curious situation in ancient Jewish religion where the name of God could be written down, so four letters writing it down, but in this word only, you never write the vowels in. Uh, so you just write Y-H-W-H, -H, uh, uh, which nowadays you know, people either say is Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, and actually, when you're reading out the Hebrew Bible, uh, you don't read out. When this word turns up, you don't actually read it out. You pronounce something else. You say Adonai, or another word for God, to replace it. And you know, it's meant to be a great sin to utter the name of God. Uh, so we don't actually know for sure how this was ever meant to be pronounced. We only know the kind of consonants. We don't know the vowels in, in the middle. So those are, some cultures really avoid uh, using particular terms. Now, those are you know, scary things. Voldemort and God are, are both quite scary. Um, but um, in other parts of the world at other times, other things might be seen as, as scary, which to us don't seem quite so scary. Uh, so, I'll try this time. Anyone here from the Isle of Man? No? Any sailors from the Isle of Man who have just hopped off a boat off the Irish Sea looking at the new border between England and Ireland? No. <laughs> uh, well, apparently, and because I'm not a sailor from the Isle of Man, apparently sailors in the Isle of Man for them, the words which you shouldn't ever say at sea are words like rat, rabbit, pig, and cat. Yeah, you just don't want to say those when you're out at sea, or even on land. Yeah, Irish Sea is a pretty um, scary place if you've ever been on a, on a ferry across the Irish Sea in a storm. You know, it gets very rough up there. So if you're an Irish man, uh, sorry, a Manx sailor, uh, uh, then you don't want to get in trouble in the sea. And you might say, well, then they shouldn't be talking about the sea, but actually rats and rabbits and pigs and cats are things that they don't like saying. So they have all sorts of, well, uh, I don't know how many Manx sailors there still are, but they would use all these different terms rather than say the word rat. So something like a long tail or uh, uncle or queer fella, rodden, jerry, uh, sakote, you know, all these terms might be used rather than saying the word rat. And if you say the word rat, it's just terrible, yeah. Uh, so rabbit, they don't use the word rabbit, they say pomet. Um, pig, they say swiney. A cat, they say something like a scratcher or, or scraper, that should be rather than scaper. So, you know, what you avoid saying is kind of quite cultural uh, and changes from one place to another. 
Now, so we've done some swears. Uh, I'm going to talk in a bit about bears, but first I'm just going to say a little bit about mother, mothers-in-law, mother-in-laws, oh, one or the other, both. Uh, some languages across the world take this sort of idea that some words you can't say, but they apply it to different people. So when you're talking to your in-laws, there are some words which you can't use when you're talking to your in-laws. And these sometimes are called um, mother-in-law languages because your mother-in-law, yeah, a lot of these are uh, indigenous languages in Australia uh, or <coughs> quite a few in Africa, um, some in South America, where you have quite, um, quite structured um, family systems. And family systems, you don't want to talk to your in-laws or you treat your in-laws with huge respect. So you speak very, very politely to your in-laws and so politely that you don't use the normal words you would use in every day, but you use special words which you only use when speaking to your mother-in-law. So here's one example from uh, another Australian Aborigine uh, language. Uh, so in everyday language, uh, you would use all these different um, words to describe different types of animal. Uh, but for all these different types of animal, for your mother-in-law, you use a different word and just one word uh, rather than all these different. Anyone guess where in Australia um, what animal they're referring to? Kangaroo. kangaroo. And, yes, here's very good, kangaroo. Uh, and actually, this word, kangaroo, um, is where we get our word from kangaroo from. Uh, so. Uh, all these different words on, on, on this side, this will mean uh, a black kangaroo, a red kangaroo, a big ca red kangaroo, or a small red kangaroo, all those different things. But if you're talking to your mother-in-law, oh, no, 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 no. You don't use any of that. Uh, you just use this one word for any kangaroo. Uh, so you don't have, you know, it's, uh, you're not going to have long conversations about kangaroos with your mother-in-law. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll get back to swearing in a bit. But um, <laughs> before that, um, I'm going to talk about bears as well, tell you something about bears and how this idea of, kind of avoidance of, of words, avoidance of particular um, vocabulary, uh, what's that got to do with bears? Well, uh, here's a nice bear. Um, what do you call that? Well, in different languages, uh, a lot of different languages have words for that animal which are quite similar. Uh, so the Latin word for bear, ursus, is where all the languages derived from Latin, that's French, Italian, Spanish, uh, Catalan, Portuguese, uh, Romanian, all these come from Latin and they all have similar words for bear which are all the French etc words all come from the Latin word ursus. Uh, the ancient Greek word Arctos, um, well, it's got an R in it. It's a bit like the Latin word ursus. Yeah, maybe it's a different vowel at the beginning, but actually, if you're a clever linguist like me, you can you know, reconstruct how those two um, can, can derive from the same thing. Uh, and the Irish and Welsh words and the Sanskrit words and the words of um, uh, uh, Iranian languages and Armenian um, all of these come back from the same w original word for bear. I uh, said earlier the Indo-European <coughs> language family, uh, huge language family, uh, all these languages derive from an earlier language called Proto-Indo-European. Down here we have Latin, and here is Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, etc., all the languages which um, derive from Latin. Uh, you can see Greek uh, just there on the Hellenic branch. Uh, you can see Sanskrit at the top there in Iranian languages. Um, you can see Welsh and Irish here in the Celtic la group of languages. Uh, so all of these languages um, are related and you can actually show how words develop in these different languages. So just looking back at our, our word for bear, you can actually reconstruct what the original word for bear spoken um, 5,000 years ago or so was. 
Now, that develops in different ways in different languages. So in Welsh, uh, it develops to the Welsh word for bear. Uh, and that gets borrowed into English. Uh, English borrows that word. Do you know what word in English comes from the Welsh word for bear? Arthur, exactly. The name Arthur comes from the Welsh word for bear. Um, uh, we have the Latin word for bear. Uh, what English word do we borrow from Latin as a kind of fancy word for relating to bears? Ursine. Ursine. Very good. You can tell we're in Cambridge here. Yeah, people. Uh, and um, any other other words in English which come from um, Ursus? Ursula, very good, yes. Ursula, uh, and, or the Ursuline mon, uh, nuns, uh, they came, come from the name of Saint Ursula, who was originally called after a little bear. She's kind of like cubby or something like that. So uh, Ursula is a Latin for little bear, and then we get that English word. Um, and then some words um, develop from Latin into other languages, like Spanish, and then get borrowed into English. Um, so the Spanish word for bear is also. Does anyone know what an osa berry is? Has anyone eaten osa berries? Apparently in California. The plains of California are rich in osa berries. And you know, these are named kind of bear berries. I've never had one, so I don't know what they're like. But yeah, we get words which are kind of come from through borrowing from other languages like this. And another set of words also relating to bears ultimately, like the English word arctic, which comes from a Latin word. Anywhere where I've got dotted lines, I mean it's borrowed rather than directly inherited, um, comes from the Greek word for bear. The arctic, um, well, the arctic, why is that called after bears? You might think, ah, polar bears. But no, it's actually because the, um, the plough, the star system, is called in, in Latin um, uh, ursus maior, uh, the great bear. And so you refer, and the plough, that star system, that constellation, sits in the north, uh, northern half of the sky. So you start calling the north uh, the Arctic. And hence, the Arctic is the, is the top of the world. Uh, so all these words come into English you know, from the original Indo-European word for bear. But, yeah, so this word survived in you know, most of these languages here. But here... You know, what happened in, here we've got English somewhere up there, yeah, English a little coming off this Germanic family. And then you've got all the um, Slavic languages like Russian and every, everything. What do they call this, um, this nice furry animal? Uh, well, we have a different word in English. Um, we have bear, which is not the same word as all those other words. Uh, and that's, you know, all the languages in the Germanic family, like Swedish and Danish, uh, all these have words which are similar to the English word for bear. And you know, like the word Arthur, they also give the, you know, the Bjorn, uh, the Swedish, it also becomes someone's name. You, know, you get called also like Ursula, you get called after bear. Um, so what's going on here? Well, the same sort of thing happens in Russian and other languages where you have another word for bear. And one theory, well, why did they have a different word for bear? Why didn't we keep the original word for bear? is it's kind of this avoidance of saying something which is scary. Yeah, it's a bit more scary than a rat or a rabbit, uh, but yeah, you might want not want to say the name of the bear. And so you develop a different way of saying it. So the Russian word for bear is a very nice example of that. Anyone knows Russian or Polish or anything this, yeah? Yes. And what does it mean in Russian? Honey, exactly right. It's honey eater, yeah. So mied um, is the word for honey, and then you have the word for eat as well, so it's a honey eater. So rather than calling it by its true name, you avoid the name, and you call it by as a honey eater. English words, and all the um, old English and Germanic ones, also seem to be something else. You're calling it the brown thing. You're saying, yeah, I don't want to go there because there are those brown things. I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, so rather than actually give the word bear, the um, uh, word octos or something like that, you actually use a, a different word. So that, you know, you can use this idea of you know, people avoiding saying something. Uh, 
also to explain bits of ling language history like that. Now, just to finish off, I'm going to look at two more words for animals in English. Uh, and yeah, here we come back to the swear words. Uh, although, yeah, they're quite cute little animals. You wouldn't think these have anything to do with, with swear words. Um, what do you call these little things? Bunnies, did you say? Yeah? Uh, anyone that call anything else? Rabbit? Yeah. Or bunny? Yeah, someone said a coney. Yeah, so this is an old word for rabbit. It was spelt like that, coney. Um, and if you, if you know the Bible, um, then you know, the Kim James version of the Bible, uh, there's quite a lot about conies. Yeah, you shouldn't eat, you know, things you shouldn't eat, camels, hares, and the coney, for they chew the cud. Now, why don't, you know, that in the Bible, why don't we say the word coney anymore? Why is it dropped out of use? Well, the interesting thing about the word coney is we now pronounce it coney, but we didn't always pronounce it like that. Uh, if you think of how it's spelt, well, other words, if you put an M at the beginning, you wouldn't say money, you'd say money. Uh, if you put an H at the beginning, you wouldn't say honey, you'd say honey. Uh, we originally called this the cunny. Uh, so this little thing hopping around was called a cunny. Uh, and you know that from actually some you know, early poems where they have lots of rhymes. You know, the day is hot and sunny, good as draft as honey, high minion for money, for want of beef and cunny. So you know, these things were actually called cunnies. Now, cunny sounds a bit like bunny, yeah, and that's actually where bunny comes from. We call them bunny rabbits rather than cunny rabbits. And can you see why we might not want to call them cunnies? Yeah, it sounds, you know, um, yeah, you might be thought to be saying something else if you're saying, oh, look, you've got a lovely cunny there. Yeah, it <laughs> might not be... Yeah, so you, you, call, you change the word a little bit. You, change it a bit, just change it to bunny, which is very innocent. No one can think anything rude of bunny. Yeah, so, uh, so that's you know, why we don't say cunny anymore. And actually, when they started reading the Bible again, in order to stop saying cunny, you know, when they're reading the Bible in, in church, uh, they would pronounce this, as we do now, coney, because that sounds much more acceptable rather than cunny. So next time anyone is, is reading a bit of um, the Bible with cunnies in it, pronounce it properly, I ask you. <laughs> um, so, and then yeah, I'm finishing off with this fellow here. Uh, because here we can actually see a kind of change which is taking place uh, in our language. The language is always changing. Words are always changing. Uh, and what we call um, this creature has changed, is changing, is in the process of changing uh, during my lifetime. Uh, so, the word cock, the old word um, for a cockerel or a rooster, uh, is known to have been used in the sense of a penis uh, since 15th century. So, uh, you can go back and look at older English t texts, and some of them are joking and playing a bit, but it's clear that people use the word cock, meaning penis, for the last 500 years. Um, and People kind of are now, in modern English, we're starting to replace the word cock. I mean, not many people say cock nowadays. When I was growing up, uh, you know, it definitely would be a word I would use um, describing that animal. Uh, in America, uh, uh, in America, yeah, already in the 19th century, they started saying this new term, rooster. Uh, so as a replacement, because you don't want to sound rude, you don't want people to get the wrong idea, so you say rooster. Uh, and you can actually, using Google Books, tracking the history of words as they appear in, in books, you can see that yeah, even with, since the uh, you know, 1960s or whatever, uh, the rise of lots of sexually explicit literature, you know, the fortunes and amount of time cock gets mentioned is on the decline. I'm sorry, but rooster is gradually coming up here. And cockerel, uh, which isn't very common, but it's getting more and more common. Cockerel originally was just a young cock, yeah, a younger um, 
uh, one of those domestic fowls, but now it can be used for any age of um, cockerel, cock. Yeah. And we also have um, the other changes that are quite nice to see. Uh, the, the word stop cock. Yeah. Stop cock, uh, as in a tap where you, <laughs> the giggling here, stop cock is just a perfectly innocent word uh, for a tap where you turn something off. Uh, they, if you see old versions of stop cocks, they often have um, cocks heads on them. Uh, but that seems to be uh, declining, whereas um, this term faucet, if you track it over you know, millions of books on, on um, Google Books, uh, then you see faucet is actually coming up uh, and replacing the stopcock. Uh, and as many of you older people might be aware, you know, that certainly has changed, has happened in kind of British English, uh, the, pro the loss of the use of the word cock in the last 40, 50 years, I think. Uh, which makes it, brings me to, yeah, uh, yeah, closing picture. Here we are in, in Jesus College, uh, and we have the fortune, good fortune, to have been founded by um, Bishop Alcock. There he is. Um, and Bishop Alcock, um, his um, symbol, his rebus, was of a cock astride a globe of the whole world uh, because everything is there, the globe, that's all, and then the cock is the cock. So it's all cock there. Now this is... Uh, um, of considerable embarrassment to fellows of Jesus when they're showing people around the, um, the college and they have to explain why we've got all these cocks everywhere. In fact, <laughs> I remember when I was first a fellow here of Jesus um, 20 years ago, uh, I was grabbed in you know, one of the first days I was here, fresh-faced, I was young, fresh-faced. Uh, I came into to, um, lunch, have some lunch, and a little old woman grabbed me by the arm and said, would you like to come and see my collection of cocks? Um, <laughs> and she did indeed have a room full of cocks, of cockerels, of, of roosters and such like. So, um, I hope in that, you know, I've, I've um, shown something about the history of... of um, swear words, the history of avoiding words, of which words are taboo, which words are profane. Uh, and I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. Time for questions. Thank you very much, James. That, that, that was fantastic. Uh, now we have lots of people, so I hope there are lots of questions. So we have uh, people coming up. There's one right at the top, and there's somebody coming. Is there one down here? We want to bring the microphone over here and one over there. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, is there any strength to the idea that language actually evolved from the rudest word? So the word piss comes from the noise, the onomatopoeia noise of piss and fart and so on. Is there any strength to that? Um, I mean, you might be right for the word piss. That, that might be an onomatopoeic word, uh, re reproducing the sound made when you piss. Uh, so that's quite possible. Uh, but for fart, fart sounds, I mean, the ancient form of fart was something like paired, which sounds yeah, less farty than fart. Fa you know, I think we have that kind of association of noise with actions, and we think, oh, that sounds you know, really appropriate. But yeah, it's quite difficult. Um, we're going back with, you know, looking at these history of words, you know, five, seven, maybe 10,000 years, but origins of language is about 100,000 years ago, if not more, so it's quite difficult to, you know, say really, go back that far. Question here. When you're thinking about which words become swear words in the sense yeah. of expletives, it seems to me that maybe the sound of the word makes a difference, so fuck is much more satisfying to say than screw or any of its mm -mm. alternatives. Is, is that true? Is there anything cross-cultural about sounds of words you use when you drop something on your toe? Um, I don't think, I mean, uh, so uh, I think the French-Canadian tabernacle is great. You know, I would say that as an as a expletive. But ostie, you know, is that really? You know, I think we give these, we endow the sounds with more force. 
because we're used to saying them, because we often utter them with more force. But I don't think cross-culturally that necessarily works. But I don't know, you know, what you'd have to do is you'd have to gather all the kind of expletive terms and you'd have to, you know, see whether some consonants are more frequent than others. And no one's done it yet, so some bright PhD student will take up that research. <laughs> We have a question over there, and then there's two over here after that. Uh, do you know of any language or culture that does not have taboo words? And if not, why do you think that is? Yeah, I, um, I've read about Japanese. I've read that in Japanese, and I don't know whether any native speakers of Japanese here, that there are, um, the, it, their taboo words are kind of like nursery terms. So they're a bit more like the wee wee um, and poo. You know, and they don't have quite the same you know, offensiveness like that. They don't have the same. They're not used by, by grown-ups in the same way. I think there are some there are some exceptions to that, particularly in terms of uh, kind of female body parts. You know, which are yeah, partly because of you know, uh, kind of traditional sexist attitudes. You know, are felt to be much more forceful and you know not used but they don't generally have such a register as far as I know I don't know Japanese but I've just read this about uh, uh. and I think certainly in um, certainly I work a lot on, on Latin and Greek and certainly in Latin and Greek they did have some uh, uh, taboo terms obscene terms but not in the so they weren't used in the same way as modern terms uh. So, uh, you know, it is quite culturally specific, I think, how you use them. There's a person just in front there, and then one over here. Thank you. You said in the beginning that fellows of Jesus have to swear in Latin. Yeah. I was wondering if it's a coincidence that the word swear means take an oath and yeah. be rude. No, that, I mean, the, um, the modern use of swear comes from the ancient, um, the early use of take an oath. And actually, when you're swearing, you're making an oath. Um, and when you're making an expletive or doing something profane, you're profaning the oath. So you're still swearing. If you swear by God, normally you would say, by God I do something. And so you're using God as your witness to the oath. Um, and then that oath becomes transferred into profane circumstances. And so, so we use the same terms to describe it. So it is the same word originally. Yeah, but well, well noticed. Thank you. There's a question over here, and then at the top. Just when you're saying about avoiding, like the, you, some yeah. other word for bear, because you avoid mm. the bear, you avoid the scary thing. Uh, my grandmother, who's incredibly superstitious, would always avoid these things, not because she was scared of them. The fear was you might bring them into being mm. by speaking their name, so mm. you didn't say it in case you actually made it happen. Uh, is that another way of looking at the things? Yeah, yeah, avoid? people. Um, uh, this is often said that, you know, that you might, you know, if you say it, then you might cause the thing to appear. And I think that's the idea with, you know, like Voldemort, that you're calling his name or something, that he might hear you and appear. Um, I'm always a bit wary of, of um, things where we say, well, uh, people in the past did that, but it's, you yeah, know, we wouldn't do that now. I mean, it, it's, it's a kind of folk belief, but it's difficult to tell, you know, whether really that's a... Uh, an explanation for why people did it, or they really believed it, or it's just a kind of, well, I don't do that because I might do it. It's difficult to say. One of the old sort of witchcraft things is if you call it by its true name, it has to answer you. Yeah. yeah. There's a question at the top, uh, and then I'll take these other two at the top and come down here as well. So actually, I'll do that one, that one, and then these two. Hello. Um, my question is twofold. I'm up here. Right. Um, so first of all, you were talking about how um, swear words in the past, like bugger and bloody, yeah. used to be really, um, you know, swear words that people would gasp at, and they're increasingly yeah. less scary to use, and lots of people use them. Um, is this a common cycle, and as swear words are used more, um, people, uh, you know, they're not as, um, what's the word, offensive? Yeah. So if that's the case, then what's the future for swear words? Will new, <laughs> worse words keep being invented? Yeah, yeah, is that yeah. how it, the cycle happens? Um, and my second question is, um, what's your favorite swear word <laughs> in any language? <laughs> well, um, I'll answer the first question first. Um, yeah, no, that's very um, good thinking about, you know, what's the kind of pattern of these things? And some things do get kind of, 
less offensive. Some things get more offensive. I mean, French is a very good example. Baiser uh, used to mean just kiss in French, but now means fuck. And it's actually, you don't, you, you do, you don't talk about, if I say, I, I baiser my wife, you know, people, yeah. But, uh, uh, but so you use a different word for, for kiss. So uh, there's uh, one rule and um, a law of swearing that they say bad meaning drives out good. So sometimes, you know, when something has an associated bad meaning, uh, then that becomes more prevalent. Uh, one, I mean, one thing which we're, which seems to be changing. I mean, just as we did have the um, uh, change from a kind of a religious vocabulary to a sexual um, scatological vocabulary. Uh, now, uh, I said I wasn't going to talk about the abuse terms, but abuse terms are becoming much more taboo. Yeah, and I think they might, you know, there might be a way in which they will evolve into expletive terms as well, because they are, you know, now the way of shocking, a way of, of, of doing. Um, oh, my favourite one. Uh, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't swear. Yeah, I don't really like swearing. <laughs> uh, two, two, I think, up in the top here. Two things. I could understand why bears and rats might be um, mm. considered. They might make people anxious, especially yeah. Isle of Man people. But why rabbits and and cats? And also, what on earth were the kangaroo, different, different names of the kangaroos, what on earth is a taboo? Why would mother-in-laws object to those? I think, I mean, I think the mother-in-law thing, to answer the taboo first, it's kind of you use a very appropriate, respectful language to the mother-in-law, and th these are felt to be too common. Uh, it's like when I get letters... They're more specific, aren't they? They're more specific, <laughs> but it's also, you know, often the more... You know, less definite thing is, is more, more polite. So like when I get a letter from my bank saying, uh, we would like to advise you that you're overdrawn. Um, <laughs> you know, they're actually telling me, they're not advising me in anything. They're saying, you know, put some money into your account. So it's a more, you know, it's a polite way of doing something and it's more roundabout. So I think that's the same thing. Yeah, but yeah, but the, the cats and the rabbits. Oh, the cats and the rabbits. Well, I think... Um, I don't, know, I don't know enough about Manx uh, fishing, but uh, you know, a lot of things which you might not think would be scary, some people, you know, they have a taboo associated with them. For some I reason. Could yeah. ask question, I believe, with especially pigs and cats, they were going to ship us to sink that those would be the, uh, the animals that would survive a shipwreck, so they would come across a sunken ship, and there would just be these animals that floated left in the water, so they became like bad omens if you found these animals, I meant the ship had gone down and these were the only survivors. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Well. And we have a question right at the top, and then there was somebody at the front row here, and then the other one at the top, and I'll see where we are then. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is, are there any words in English that, that are so offensive that you wouldn't pronounce them? Is there, is there a level of uh, offensiveness that, that is so strong, that is stronger than fuck, and the level that you wouldn't even... I mean, we haven't... Uh, I mean, I've, I've avoided saying the word cunt so far, because I think that's... <laughs> <my> <laughs> <laughs> uh. Well, the fact that you can pronounce it here means that it's not that offensive. I think, I think it is pretty offensive. I mean, I think, <laughs> yeah, there is a reason why I, I uh, avoided saying it. The thing I've is probably gone quite red yeah, now. There yeah. was a question about languages that don't have um, any swear words. To me, English is that language. Uh, I'm a Russian speaker, and mm. our swear swearing language is like a different language. And the, 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 the degrees and the variety of, uh, you know, of, the, of uh, how offensive that could be are so... Sometimes, I don't know, you, you can't even... Um, you, can't, you can't even pronounce certain words. Uh, and when my friends ask me to swear in Russian, I would really not do that. I, I think go red because this is so strong that you yeah, can't yeah. even think about those words. I, I think in, in um, you know, 50 years ago, uh, I would no way, you know, 20 years ago, you know, I would have been lynched, you know, coming here and speaking like this, you know, using words like fuck and cunt. And, and I think, you know, we have really changed a huge amount in quite a short space of time in this, in this country. And I only hope that, well, in Russia, probably, yeah, it might yet come to you.
So, yeah. um, there was a question at the front here, then up there, then over. There were two over here. That's what we those two up there. Right. Uh, I appreciate the answer might be that it's too early to tell, <laughs> but I wondered if technology, especially how communications have mm. internationalised, have had an effect on those quite separate branches of taboo words. Yeah. So you picked out Dutch and mm -hmm. Quebecois yeah, and yeah. English. Um, now that we're all able to communicate with one another so much quicker and more efficiently, are those barriers breaking down? Um, and therefore, is there more importing that people have noticed, or is, is it just too early to tell? I, I mean, I, uh, Dutch is, is interesting because when I, you know, my wife is a Dutch speaker, and I think, you know, some elderly female relevant uh, relative of hers, when I went to visit, you know, she dropped something and she just said, oh shit. Oh, wow. And, you know, but in, in, in Holland, shit is actually incorporated as a very, very mild swear term, which, you know, and I think it was from disc jock, as they say, in the 1960s or 1970s, when they're trying to, you know, use cool English terms. Uh, and, and, you know, so it really ameliorated in Holland. And, and so, you know, there's something in what you say that I think some of the so international English and, you know, words like fuck are becoming so ubiquitous that I think, and that's partly why it's, you know, its force is, is um, lessened. Uh, and I think that, you know, it is too early to tell, but it's one possibility of what will happen. So we'll take the question at the top, then there were the two over here, uh, and then there's one here, one brief one there, and then we'll let James go. <laughs> Um, my question's just on like the gendering of swear words, like yeah. um, in English particularly. Why are words like cunt and twat so much ruder than dick and prick? Is it just sexism? I think it is just sexism. Yeah, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> I, I don't think. I think. I think it's a more powerful term to say cunt and twat than just to say dick or not or whatever. I think it's. It has more. It has. It's more powerful rather than being sexist. Why? I um. Yeah. <laughs> I. I <laughs> we have other questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if we take the two questions over here. Um, I'm just wondering um, if um, power difference mm -hmm. um, gives the um, abusive language user. Mm -hmm. um, license to, uh, to, to use it. Um, when I say power, I mean um, it can be um, stately power, uh, financial power, um, physical power. Um, what I have in uh, mind um, is uh, a letter which um, had been circulating uh, in the media recently, uh, written by <clears throat> Um, the American president mm -mm. to uh, the Turkish president, uh, in which he says, don't be stupid, as clearly as that, mm -mm. using these words. Don't be stupid. Don't be, don't be a tough guy. And then he says, you are my friend. I love you, mm. type of thing. Does the um, modern times um, give uh, the powerful a better license to use abusive language to less powerful? I mean, I think in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of swear words, certainly expletives and rude words, you know, w some people who have the power uh, not to be punished and to use them when other people might not have that license not to be punished. You know, that does make it a, a, an exercise of power, yeah, which is, I think, why um, um, people do find, you know, words like, like fuck on the BBC quite disturbing because it's not words which they feel they could have license to use, whereas, um, you know, they might, not be able to, they might not be able to say that in their workplace or, or at home or whatever because they don't, you know, they would be um, punished or, or they would have some uh, comeback from that. So I think it is certainly, um, it's taken as an abuse of power to use uh, language like that. We'll take those, those three last questions, mm. but if they could be brief, that would yeah. be very helpful. So. And some people with Tourette syndrome express their tics through yeah. expletives. Yeah. I know that in English. So how does that manifest in other languages? Um, 
As far as I know about Tourette's syndrome, because it's interesting because it's not just expletives, it's also kind of unacceptable noises as well, isn't it? Because it's, it's various um, non-verbal noises. Uh, and that's, it, it, you know, the neurology is quite interesting because they've done particular um, uh, surveys of parts of the brain and said that, you know, it is a, the same center where you're, it's actually your kind of inhibition control um, which is where you don't have this quite tight neuro same neurological control or chemical in your brain or whatever, which stops you from doing that. Uh, now, I don't know how that works in other languages with Tourette's, I'm afraid. So that was a long way of, of saying I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question just over here, if you pass the microphone along. Yeah, hello. Um, so you mentioned that Tourette's is quite common in Europe. When I lived in Kent as a kid back in the 50s, mm. it was... We were always told, anyway, a common London greeting was, watch a cock. Watch a cock, yeah, yeah. I wonder yeah. if that was still alive. Yeah. The other thing just to say is, I feel a lot of swear words I use anyway, but suddenly something annoying happens, it is an expletive. Yeah. Uh, they, they involve letters of the alphabet which, are, you know, uh, you explode. Yeah, yeah, so they do have that physical force. But, you know, no, I, I meant to mention watch a cock being, you know, actually, you know, standard kind of... Um, uh, London East End, Cockney speak, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then our, our last question, I'm sorry to speak, we haven't been able to take, was, was over there. I didn't want to let you off the hook entirely, so it was, it was said in a way over here, what's your favourite word to say? I would like to propose the question, which uh, word interests you in an evolutionary standpoint? Which one's the most complex, dynamic, which do you find most fascinating in what we've talked about? its transitions from the origins and to what it's gone to? Well, uh, yeah, uh, one, um, I did write an article once about one um, term, minge, about the etymology of minge, which has, to me, a fascinating etymology, and it's actually on my Academia Edu page. It's my most downloaded article, so... <laughs> <laughs> you can, <laughs> um, so you'll have to read that, but it has got, you know, it's uh, an interesting story of how we got the word minge in English. <laughs> James, that was a good talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you all very much for coming. Hopefully see you again at more of our events. And the bar is uh, just across the way. All the best.